All right, here we are, First and Second Thessalonians. We're in First Thessalonians. This is lesson number five, preparing for the end. Uh, if you've got your uh, Bibles open, you can uh, open them to uh, First Thessalonians uh, chapter four, because that's where we're going to be reading today. So the theme for our study has been preparing for the second coming, and our text has been the first epistle of, the, uh, of Paul to the Thessalonian church. And I've told you that in this epistle, Paul commends the Thessalonians for being what's called a true church. They're a true church. You know, uh, today we often measure the uh, authenticity of a, of a church sometimes by how big it is. Uh, anytime I go somewhere you know, and they say, oh, oh, you're a minister, oh, uh, you're a minister, and the very next question is where, they want to know where are you a minister, you know, and I'll say, all right, I'm chalked out church. And then nine times out of 10, the next question will be, so how big is your church? It's never how pure is your church, or how spiritual is your church, or how busy is your church, it's always, so how big is your church? The idea meaning that you know, the size of your church determines the credibility of your, of your ministry. And that's interesting because in the churches of Christ, 90% of the churches of Christ are 150 people or less. We're actually a, kind of a medium-sized congregation here in, in Choctaw. So people judge you know, the, the truthfulness, the credibility, uh, many times by size or influence or the quality of the building or the type of worship service or how big, how many people, the fourth question is, you, so how many people on your staff? You know, and if you say, well, I'm all by myself, you know, or we're just two or something like that. But Paul, in speaking to the Thessalonians and preparing them for the return of Jesus, describes the, the biblical nature of the true church. And he says that a true New Testament church is established by the preaching of the true gospel by sincere and effective Christian preachers. One of the questions should be, well, what gospel did you hear? You know, at your church, what gospel are you preaching? Just to make sure you've got the thing, you know, um, you've got the true gospel. Um, also, the true church's conduct is, 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 and purity is continually being refined and challenged by the Holy Spirit. That, that's a, a measure of the true church. You know, what are you doing to gain greater uh, maturity in spiritual matters? That, that would be a good question to ask somebody. Where are you preacher at and how's your church? And, and what are the things that your church uh, are, are doing in order to uh, grow in Christ? That's a legit question. And of course, the, the true church is growing in the knowledge of spiritual things. Those are much more you know, accurate measurements of what we would call a true church. Uh, one thing interesting, if you read the New Testament, the apostles never condemned any congregation or any church for not growing in numerical size. You go ahead and read through the New Testament, there's never ever a criticism, you guys are small, how come you only got 25 members, how, how come you only got 90 members? You, know, you, you never hear an apostle say anything like that to any congregation. However, they often exhorted churches for not growing more in purity in their conduct. Yeah, you hear that a lot, 1 Corinthians, for example. Or growing in the knowledge of spiritual things, Galatians, Colossians, Hebrews. You know, uh, I wish that you could be eating meat, but you, know, you have to be still fed on milk, the milk of the word. You know, you're not growing spiritually. You get those criticisms in the New Testament. So true churches are continually advancing in their knowledge of Christ and His teachings, especially in the serious preparation for His sure return one day. And we're getting into that in our lesson today. So today we're going to review Paul's teaching about the end times and how to prepare for the end times. So let's begin chapter four, verse 13. It says, or he said, he writes, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So it seems that the Thessalonians were worried about what would happen to those Christians who died before Jesus returned. And you wonder, why, why were they worried? 
Well, first of all, they expected Jesus to return during their lifetime. You know, Jesus went up to heaven, the apostles saying, well, the Lord you know, ascended up to heaven and He's going to return. And they're thinking, okay, He's going to return. A week, a month maybe, a year or two, He's going to return. They assumed that He would be returning in their lifetime. And what was happening was all of a sudden Uncle Joe died and Grandpa, you know, uh, uh, whatever, uh, passed away and my mom died and all of a sudden Christians were dying before Jesus returned. Well, today that's just normal, right? I mean, but during this time in the first century, that had never happened before. They all assumed He would return while they were all alive, and all of a sudden some of them are dying. So they wondered, well, what happens to those that have died? Because the promise was when He returns, He's going to bring you with them to heaven. Great. Well, what about the ones who died? What's he going to do with them? That was a legit question for them in the first century. So they were a first generation Christians who had little teaching on this matter while Paul was with them. Remember last time I told you that he was only with them you know, a couple of weeks. Well, how much teaching can you do in a couple of weeks? So there are special words here. He says, uh, I don't want you to be uninformed. Uninformed is simply a lack, of, a lack of knowledge or ignorant. And he also says they're asleep. Um, and uh, this word in the New Testament was used uh, to represent the death for Christians, not for non-Christians, but for Christians, because sleep you know, is a peaceful rest and it's only temporary. We know when we sleep, we wake up again. And so the writers use that term sleep or asleep to refer to a Christian who had died. It was a peaceful rest, it was only temporary. So Paul didn't want them to react to death of a Christian in the same way that non-Christians reacted to death. Non-Christians reacted to death in, well, one of several ways. One, for example, they ignored it. Non-believers pretended, well, it didn't happen, you know, it's not going to happen to me, they, they put it off, they refused to discuss it and really deal with it, deal with the eventuality of their own death. The majority of people are still like this today, right? You talk to somebody who has no faith or no you know, spiritual beliefs and you talk to them about dying and it's like, psh, you know, they don't want to talk about that, that's a non-subject. You know? It's not a good thing to talk about. Or, Someone who doesn't believe, uh, they just deny it in a way. I don't mean they deny that death happens. They're in denial. They call it something else. I mean, there are whole religions built up around the idea that death isn't really death, but really it's a transformation of sorts. The idea is that they really don't die. They live on through their children, or they're absorbed into the greater consciousness, or they're reincarnated into something else. You know. Everything except you're dead and your body is just rotting in the ground. You know, they, they don't like to face that, that awful fact. Or this is probably the most common reaction to death by non-believers. They fear it. And this is the reaction that Paul is talking about here. The people of his generation, they knew death and their only response was fear. Fear and grief because they had no hope beyond the grave. So they either were stoic, you know, well, it happens, it happens, you know, what am I going to do? Or they were in denial, they didn't want to talk about it and think about it. Or they were afraid of it and they made up all kinds of ways to kind of deal with it. But Paul wanted the Christians at Thessalonica to be informed concerning death and what eventually would happen to those who died as Christians. Don't be afraid of it, don't deny it, it happens. Let me tell you what happens when a Christian dies. So Paul is saying Christians shouldn't ignore it, deny it, or fear death. They should open their eyes and see what exactly is going to happen to all Christians when they die, or when the end of the world comes. 
And of course, this lesson's so pertinent, of course, to them because they asked the question, but it's for us too. What happens when we die? What happens if the end comes while we're still here? So uh, you know, most people, when they talk about this subject, will want to go to the book of Revelation to get information. But the most practical, clear information is here in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians as well. And so uh, he says, Gentiles, you know, at the end of this passage in verse 13, he says, Gentiles have no hope but Christians, they have hope. So in verse 14, he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So he says, Christians are not like Gentiles. They have hope for life after death because they have an historical precedent upon which they can base their faith, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do I know I'm going to resurrect? Why do I know it's possible? Because Jesus resurrected, and the one who resurrected promised me that I would resurrect also. So that's, you know, that's a pretty good promise by somebody who can back the promise up. So the basic promise that Jesus makes to His disciples is that if they believe and trust Him, what happened to Him after death will happen to them as well after death resurrection to a new life without reference to death ever again. It's the best promise of any religion. You study any religion, uh, compare all the religions of the world, Hinduism and Buddhism and all the isms, Islam, all the religions, and you focus in on the promise that they make to their followers. And I guarantee you this is the absolute best promise you resurrect from the dead as yourself. You're not absorbed into the great consciousness. You know, most Eastern religions, you know, the best bet for afterlife is you're absorbed into the great consciousness. You lose consciousness of who you are. And a lot of them, if you want that, you have to do a lot of things here on earth. You better get it right. Some religions is, well, even if you do everything right, and if, and if God decides He doesn't want you, oh well, you lose at the end, you know? They have a fickle God. They have a God who will say, do this, and if you do it, maybe He'll answer, maybe He won't. But that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve tells us, if you believe in Christ, and if your hope is in Him, then what happened to Him is going to happen to you. We have someone who resurrected. Every other religious leader in the world throughout history, they're all dead. When I teach a class on you know, major religions of the world and we study all the major religions and we find out who was the starter of that religion or who was the great prophet of that religion or who was the one that you know, uh, had the first idea of that religion, all those prophets, all those leaders, they're all dead. And a lot of them we know, they were born here and they died there. Christianity is the only religion whose leader is still alive. So we have a great promise in Christ Jesus. Now, why does He resurrect from the dead? Why? Because Jesus died without sin. And so therefore death could not hold Him. Acts chapter two. You know, you're, that, that's a spiritual kind of principle you know, like gravity, gravity, there's, a, there's a, a physical principle going on there with gravity. I suppose you could even express it mathematically or something. You know what I'm saying? If you drop something, gravity will pull it down. You know. Well, there's also a spiritual truth as well, spiritual laws. If you break God's laws, any one of them, you die. In other words, you are separated from God. That's what the word Death means, it means separation. And if you're separated from God, why do they call it death? It's death because God is the living one. And if you're separated from the living one, you don't have life. So why did Jesus resurrect? Because as a human, He had no sin. He didn't break that spiritual law. So therefore death, that status, that state, couldn't hold Him. So when we become Christians, we also die without sin, but not because we didn't, break, we didn't break that spiritual law. We don't have sin because our sins are forgiven. They're taken away. There's the difference. 
Jesus gets to resurrect because He never sinned, He never broke that law. We get to resurrect because our sins that we were guilty of are forgiven. And so we kind of obey that spiritual law by default through faith, if you wish. So when we become Christians, we die without sin, so death cannot hold us either. Jesus without sin because He didn't commit any, we without sin because we're forgiven for the ones that we have committed. All right, so Paul is reassuring the Christians at Thessalonica that as sure as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will resurrect all those who have died faithfully serving the Lord. There's no need to worry that they will be left behind. All who believed in Jesus will be raised by Jesus when He returns. So that's the main premise. Now we're going to look at the details. Paul gives the details as to what the Christian will experience at the end of the world, but you have to understand something before we read the passage. He's going to talk about what happens to Christians at the end of the world in very practical terms, but there are some things that he's not going to explain, okay? For example, he is not going, whoop, hang on a second, here we go. He is not going to explain or talk about the resurrection of sinners. That also happens at the end of the world, but Paul's not going to talk about that here in 1 Thessalonians. If you want to find out what happens to sinners at the end of the world, you have to read Matthew 25 or Acts chapter 24. Paul also is not going to talk about the judgment of the wicked, because that happens at the end of the world too. But he doesn't talk about that here in 1 Thessalonians. If you want to find out about the judgment of the wicked, you need to go to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. You get the drift here of what's happening? Um, Paul does not talk about what happens to the physical heavens and the physical earth here when he talks about the end of the world. He doesn't talk about that. If you want to know what happens to the physical heaven and the physical earth, you have to go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, and there Peter will explain what happens to the physical heavens and the earth at the end of the world. Paul does not talk about hell or the punishment of sinners here in 1 Thessalonians. Now that's what happens at the end of the world, but he doesn't talk about that particular thing in this passage. If you want to know about that, you have to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. And Paul also does not talk about the phenomenon of, of Jesus uh, you know, gathering the kingdom together and offering it up to the Father. That's also, that's also something that happens at the end of the world, but Paul doesn't talk about it here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You have to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to learn about that particular phenomenon. Now, listen carefully. This doesn't mean that all of these things are not happening at the same time at the end of the world, but Paul focuses his attention on what will happen to Christians at the end of the world. You see, the mistake that people make when they're talking about you know, the end of time, the end of the world, when Jesus returns, all those terms refers to the same time, is that they take all of these events and they try to string them on a continuum. This happens, and then you know, there's a thousand years, and then that happens, and then, there's a, and then that happens, and then Jesus, and then that happens, and then this happens. You know? They string them along. They don't understand that all of these things that I just mentioned, all of them happen in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, so the resurrection of sinners, the judgment of the wicked, the heavens and the earth you know, taken away, the punishment of sinners, the giving up of the kingdom, the resurrection of the righteous, the, all meeting up with, all of that happens in the twinkling of an eye. There's no this and then you know, a couple of years later that and then a thousand years that, no. No. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52, Paul, referring to the end of the world, referring to the, the great transformation that's going to take place, says all of this happens in the twinkling of the eye. You think that's not possible? The same God who said, you know, let there be light, you know, and a gazillion stars show up in a moment, if He can do that, 
Well, he can certainly do this. So that's where the confusion comes in when you're discussing the end of the world with your evangelical or Pentecostal friends and family. They believe that all these events are strung out. We believe that the Bible teaches that all these events take place in one moment. Okay, so let's focus in a little bit here. Paul confirms that the details he's about to teach them were taught to him directly by the Lord Himself concerning His return. So he's not going to talk about all these things. He's only going to talk about one of the things that happens when the Lord returns. And that is, what happens to Christians when the Lord returns? So what does he say? He says in verse 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, he says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, let's just stop there. What does he say, first of all? He says that some Christians will still be alive and on the earth when Jesus returns. Isn't that amazing? Think about that for a second. If it happened in our lifetime, it would mean that the return of the Lord and all those events that I talked about, we would, we would be there. You know, all those quote, left behind books and series and stuff like that. The people who write those books and make those movies, they believe in the strung out theory. This happens, that happens, this, you know. Makes for good TV and sci-fi. Not accurate biblically. Most movies are not accurate biblically, if you've noticed. So what is going to happen at the end of the world when Jesus returns? He says, first of all, some of you, some Christians, will still be alive, doing your business, going to work, you know, yeah. Then what's going to happen? Then he says um, in verse 15b, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So these Christians who are alive on earth will not go to heaven before the ones who are dead and resurrected. So this was the answer to their question right there. What happens to the ones who are dead when Jesus returns? Paul says to them, don't worry about them. You're not going to go to heaven before they're resurrected. They, you, won't, you, know, you won't go somewhere that they will not follow. And how will it happen? Well, they will be res resurrected first. Then what happens? Verse 16a, it says, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. So what happens? The Lord will descend from heaven. What will happen? Will it be a big explosion? Will we, get, will we hear? No, he says, the Lord will descend in the same way He ascended. He ascended, there were witnesses to that, eyewitnesses. He will descend, there will be eyewitnesses to that as well in verse 16a. And then what's going to happen, he says, the signs of His appearance, 16b, He will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. So the signs of His appearance, a shout, a voice, a trumpet. Now these could be, all be symbolic ways of saying that Jesus' coming will be announced in such a way that no one will miss it. No one will miss it because you know, if, an, if, if there's a shout, who does the shouting? Well, you know, God does the shouting. You know. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, all ways of saying a spiritual announcement will be made. Let me, let me ask you this. How did Lazarus hear <coughs> excuse me, uh, Jesus when Jesus said to him, Lazarus, come forth? Did Jesus actually have to say that to resurrect Lazarus? No. That was for the audience. That was for the audience. But somehow Lazarus' spirit could hear the one that he had faith in and resurrect it. You know, I've always, I've always believed that if God wants to get in touch with me, it doesn't matter where I am. <laughs> he knows where to find me at all times. 
Whether I'm alive or dead, He always knows where to find me. God never misplaces one of His children. We do at times, and I can tell you stories when we, you know, everyone was packed into the car and we were a half mile down the road and said, counting the children, and go, oh, oh, wait, wait, there's one missing, and we had to drive back to the park or something. You know? And I see a lot of guilty looks among you, so I see that we've, we've shared that experience. And so when Jesus returns, it will be obvious the believers who are alive and the ones who are dead, they will know. God will be able to contact them. And then he says, the dead in Christ will be resurrected. And they'll be resurrected first, he said. Again, answering their question. Don't worry, grandma will be resurrected, your uncle Joe will be resurrected, don't worry, you're not going to leave without them. Now, this does not mean that at some later date sinners will be resurrected because Paul here is dealing with only Christians who are alive and those who are dead, Christians who are dead, uh, when Jesus returns. So try to think of it this way. In a situation where many things will be happening simultaneously, Paul is concentrating on one specific thing and that is the Christian and the Christian's experience when Jesus returns. That's what he's doing here. His point is, before the alive Christians go to be with Jesus, the dead Christians will first be resurrected. Number six, when Jesus returns, the, the saints will ascend with Jesus, in verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the living and the resurrected Christians will ascend into the clouds to be with Jesus. In the same way Jesus ascended in a cloud to return to heaven, the living and the resurrected Christians will also ascend to be with Jesus in the sky. Notice here, there's no mention of any Christians remaining on the earth, as is taught we, very often by other groups. There's no mention here that the Christians stay. When the Christians are resurrected and the ones who are alive when Jesus returns, that's a specific time in history, in the future, then those immediately are caught up into heaven with Christ. There's no I'm on earth, we wait a thousand years, we do this, there's a war, none of that. None of that stuff. Number seven, when Jesus returns the eternal life, the sanctified life promise, the perfection, you know, whatever you want to call it, begins. The condition of being together with Jesus in the heavens, not on earth, will be the situation that will remain forever. So he says to them, this knowledge concerning the end of time and death gives a Christian great comfort and confidence to face the end of his life here on earth, and these people should use this teaching to encourage one another. Chapter four, verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. How comforting is that? Don't worry, if you're alive as a Christian, Jesus will take you up with him when he returns, and you won't miss it. You're sick and you're old and you're, you're deaf and blind in some nursing home somewhere, nobody's visiting you, don't worry about it. You'll know when He returns, even if you're alive. And if you're dead and gone and there's nothing but ashes in the dirt because you've died a hundred years before He returns, don't worry about it. He'll resurrect you. That's a, that's a, that's a promise. Then the eighth thing, when Jesus returns, no warning. Again, which defies all the teaching that we see in other groups. I don't mean to be critical here of the individuals, but the teaching itself is not accurate. This business of watching for the signs and you know, it'll happen here in you know, 2017, that's when it's going to happen. And get ready, you know, I see the signs in the skies, get ready, the, the end is near. Well, yeah, in a way, the end is near. It could be right now. 
but that you know because of certain geopolitical things going on in the world that the end is near? No. You're, you're just selling your newsletter is what you're doing. No one knows for certain when Jesus will return. What does he say? Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, now notice he says the time, meaning the specific time, and then the epochs, meaning you know, the era. Will it be in the 20th century? Will it be in the modern era? You know, he says, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. In other words, even in those days, there were people who were predicting when Jesus would return. And Paul is simply repeating the words of Jesus. Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? Nobody knows. Only the Father knows. Nobody knows. The only thing that's certain is He will. He will come. Verse three says, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. There will even be some who are teaching peace and safety, just like the false prophets in the Old Testament who prophesied the security of Jerusalem, for example, when in reality Jerusalem was on the verge of destruction. So the destruction that'll come at the end of the world for sinners will be suddenly, without any warning, and it'll be total. None will escape. So there's a brief description of what happens to sinners while Christians are being brought up with Christ. Notice he makes an allusion to them, to that thing. So they were young Christians with a specific question about a complicated teaching. So Paul gives them a focused, specific response without going into great detail. He says, or Paul rather, is adding to the knowledge of the Thessalonian church concerning the return of Jesus and the situation regarding these Christians who will already be dead when He comes. What does He do? He reassures them that their hope in Christ based on His resurrection will be fulfilled in their own resurrection when He comes. Do not doubt that. Don't doubt it, ever doubt it. Our resurrection is not based on how we feel. Oh, I'm feeling really spiritual, or I'm feeling really low. It's not based on how successful we are. I'm, I'm succeeding physically and spiritually, I'm getting all my ducks in a row, come on Jesus, I'm ready. No, it's not based on that. Our resurrection is based on the promise that God has given to us, not based on us. The only matter that we have control over is I believe or I don't believe. I believe and therefore I act as a person who believes. Remember, God has not asked us for perfection. He's asked us for faith despite imperfection. That's the hard one, to continue believing while we observe the imperfection and death in the world, and while we observe our own imperfection, the question arises in our own mind, how would He ever want to save me? That's the, that's the big obstacle. And then he gives the details concerning Jesus' return, focusing in on what will happen to Christians specifically on the last day. When Jesus returns, the dead in Christ will be resurrected first. Both the living and the resurrected Christian will ascend to be with Jesus in heaven forever. And thirdly, no one knows when this will happen, but it'll happen suddenly. So perhaps some of us will be alive when Jesus returns. It could be in our lifetimes. The comfort that I receive from this, whether I'm alive or dead, when He returns, has two elements, let me share those and the lesson will be done. First of all, I have hope when facing death because either way I will eventually be with Jesus. 
this is my destiny. This is your destiny. This is our destiny as Christians. One of the reasons that God you know, formed the church was that he understood that people of faith, sinners, but sinners who have faith, needed mutual support. And they needed to be taught continually, as we are this morning, sharing, supporting one another, teaching, to remain faithful until the end, because the end is assured. Make no mistake about that. Remember this with everything that you do and with all the decisions that you make. And then number two, I will be with you and you will be with me someday. I know that I will see you again. All of my brothers and sisters that I love, I will see again. And here's the beautiful part. And the next time, without sin. All those things that get on my nerves that you people do, <laughs> they'll be gone. <laughs> It'll be easier for you than me, I understand, but... Uh. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying. The beauty of heaven is that we'll be together, but there'll be no sin. You know, the love that we have for one another now will be you know, multiplied, I don't know, purified in such a way. No sin. What a wonderful, we have a wonderful fellowship as it is. Imagine how marvelous it'll be when, when we're all, all that sin is stripped away and just the pure spirit of Christ lives within each of us. Be a marvelous thing. So let's use this teaching to encourage ourselves when facing death, but also to encourage ourselves when tempted to sin or be faithless. Remember, the end comes suddenly. What a joyful thing to know that as we're walking down the street one day, boom, you know, we're with the Lord. I know the first thing I think I'm going to say is, woof, am I glad I hung in there? That's the first thing I think. Or maybe, oh Lord, you're so wonderful. Maybe that's what will be the first thing. Okay, so that's our lesson for this time. We'll keep on going with Thessalonians next time.